All right, hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is March 4th, 2024. Boy, we got a, a an exciting deep one for you here today. Of course, it's it's not the finished picture, but I'm sure over the coming oh maybe five months or so, <laughs> we will be able to continue to build and and to reveal even deeper connections in this. Uh, as you will see from the title, I don't know exactly what it will be yet, but it'll be in relation to Leviathan and Bohemoth. We've touched on them before, excuse me, and I'm going to delve deeper into it today and, and show these connections to, to who they are, what their portion is, how they equal their time and tribulation, where their power comes from, and even a little bit when we go to the Apocryphas. Again, for anybody that's new, we don't go to the Apocryphas and find things and then go to scripture and say see we prove things out in scripture first and then because we have an understanding of a number of the apocryphas we might go in there to see what kind of detail we can find and we end up finding of course more detail and it has matched every single time including this time when you're going to see uh, uh many things but in relation to a group of people you see, we've been talking about the end of days and and how this is an end of days ministry being revealed, of course. The books are open. But we've talked about how, you know, many people will say, oh, it's um, it's Trump or it's uh, it was it was Bush or it's Macron or it's, it, you know, uh, Prime Minister of Canada, right? Uh, Trudeau. And they think that maybe that's the Antichrist. They might be part of the system in some sense, some of them, not all of them. But we're going to see, as Scripture is revealed, and we have shown over and over and over again, the end of days and the enemies against Christ are the Arabs. Now, when I say Arabs, I mean specifically the Muslim portion of it. And you're going to see that revealed again tonight in the Apocryphas, in fact, there's one apocrypha we've gone into a number of time a number of times over the years, and I generally just use it because there's one picture that is just so crystal clear of of the pre-trib, the seals, the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the place prepared, which is paradise for the mid-trib great multitude, and then I show how there's more time after it. Well, tonight we're going to go into that more time after it and see how much more detail we get because. It's there. It's there. But that's not where we're going to spend the bulk of our time. We're just going to make points in it once we talk about these portions in Scripture and show how we've understood these connections along the way in it. So with that, I think many of you guys might have thought I was going to be doing a live show tonight on um, Black Swan Revelations right here. So this channel right here, BSR Black Swan Revelations, this is our brother Shane. He actually lives close to me. Um, I'm going to be doing a live show with him tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, which is 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 5.30 p.m. Pacific. So if you guys want to look that up, you can come and subscribe to him here um, or just come and watch. Up to you. And uh, we'll be there tomorrow. Uh, we did have a meeting uh, last Thursday. We chatted for a bit, um, you know, explained some of the things so we can have a, a better idea as to what it is that's going on in this ministry and the revelations, being able to understand it. And, <laughs> of course, it's a lot to take in. So I try not to overwhelm, but we're going to talk about some of those things that, that we've all known here for a while. But we're going to continue as we share it with other channels and other ministries to try to reach more and more and more people. So with that, that'll be tomorrow. And another reminder, uh, a couple things, actually. Our brother Steve over in Uganda, uh, he has a, another mission. You know, there's, there's a mission. He's doing stuff every couple weeks, uh, sometimes three times a month. Um, but this one is another pretty big one, and they're going into the Congo. So they've got, like, some sort of stadium reserved for them in the Congo. So they, of course, are always in need of our support. You know, we are the sole support for that ministry as well. 
Um, they had a great outreach here just over the weekend where one of the pastors came and stood up that came against him and rebuked him and, and the teachings from the Ministry Revealed book. Now, they don't teach from the Ministry Revealed book only. They teach Scripture. They bring people to salvation. They, they give them the understanding of Scripture within salvation. You know, the, properly done. And then as they learn that, and they're teaching some of these pastors to grow in understanding because a lot of them are new. Then they incorporate the end of days book, the, the ministry revealed end times book. And as you know, in the in the stories past, many pastors there had come against the book and uh, they all started coming back to him. Like, I think hundreds started coming back to him and apologizing. And and over this weekend, when they were at an outreach, one of the pastors came and stood on stage and apologized to all of his congregation for it. Uh, they they recorded it. They, you know, had pictures for us. Uh, it was really something. And then, of course, more men were th that were there gave their lives to Christ. So it's always exciting. And and for this one coming up in two days, um, on the sixth and on the seventh, uh, sorry, the sixth through the ninth, they're going to be in the Congo. So for anybody that can support, please do. And one thing you'll notice, you can support right here. You can go to ministryrevealed.com. Or you can go to here, click more links. And when you do, there's our shipping address. But you're going to notice only PayPal is what we have now. If you wanted to use, say, a credit card or, or direct debit account, um, you could download the app and you could do it without setting up a PayPal account. But if you do, you can just click on this and do it normally. Send it as a gift like, you know, family and friends. And we'll get that over to Steve as well. And the reason we're only doing uh, PayPal now is because a lot more restrictions, um, uh, GoFundMe would no longer allow me to do it unless I submitted to them every single thing that Steve bought, all of the receipts, all of the travel, everything. So I just said, forget it. You know, maybe we'll look for another uh, system to use. Um, but PayPal has always been the the greater one, anyways. So with that, if you do want to help support him and support the ministry uh, overall as well, you can go to our PayPal link right here. Um, the other thing I did with uh, Black Swan Revelations is what I do with everybody. I always recommend everybody come to this playlist right here on the YouTube channel and come watch the first four videos in this play in this uh, intro series. The other place you can go is, excuse me, to our website ministryrevealed.com, and when you come here, you'll still find the GoFundMe right now, but that's being changed. It's going to be taken care of here real quick. Um. So don't try to click it. The the it's it says it's closed, but this is the first 22 minute intro to just uh, uh, ease people in to what they're going to see in the next three videos. This is the 30 minute intro on the differences of the gospels being revealed, showing that the Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the end of days, the synoptic gospels, the last will be first, the first will be last. It goes Luke, Mark, and Matthew. You'll understand things why he was arrayed in white or a gorgeous robe, which means white radiant. In Luke and in Mark, he was arrayed in purple. In Matthew, he was arrayed in scarlet. You see, the bride is a white radiant gown. Purple and scarlet are tribulation colors, right? The woman riding the beast is purple and scarlet. Jesus' words on the cross in Luke, Father, into your arms, I receive, uh, receive, uh, Father, into your arms, receive my spirit. But in Mark and in Matthew, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why the difference in those words? Well, it turns out the word forsaken means leave behind. So just like purple and scarlet are tribulation colors, you're going to see that that leave behind is only found in Mark and Luke's gospel. It's incredible. This is just a 30-minute Bible study to get you to begin to reveal to you the understanding. Once you begin to understand that, you'll realize that the end of days is not seven years long, and the reason everybody thought it was seven years is because everybody learned from the Gospel of Matthew. Once you realize the purpose for Mark and the purpose for Luke and the Synoptic Gospels, you'll realize the truth of the end of days. To understand from there is this bigger video. So this was also a 30-minute intro into the time, the timeline of true tribulation. When you come to this one, this is a big one, about 2 hours, 45 minutes. It's all because of Matthew. You're going to see that all of this has been missed that people have jumbled up understandings together and, and put something over the other and say it's the same time and everything else. There's a reason why people can all go 
through the scriptures and some people are pre some people are mid some people are post and all of them can show it with scripture it's because the answer is pre mid and post are all true in a period called 14 years and luke's portion called above which is a period of 50 days pre-trib mid-trib great multitude rapture the pre-trib we call the escape of the bride the pre-trib escape the mid-trib great multitude rapture is in the seventh year of seals and of course the return of the lord post-trib in the seventh year of trumpets for the year the day of the lord which is the year of his vengeance how did all of this get missed well you'll come to understand that in this big teaching here it's all because of matthew this one is it's such an eye-opener those others are huge because they lead you to understand oh my goodness how did this get missed you'll, you'll be going through those saying that how did how did we not see this how how was this not yet understood this will help you to understand it and one of the big reasons it wasn't time but in the world of scripture the reason it wasn't understood was because everybody is taught from the gospel of matthew and we only look to mark and luke as as little bits of insight to things that already took place while reading matthew completely missing what was truly hidden prophetically in the gospels from there and this is what i did with black swan as well so he watched these videos so he's got an idea he you know it was a lot to take in as i say but he's got an idea and i shared a little bit more so tomorrow's live show with him will be a lot of fun and once you begin to understand those you can go deeper this is a three-hour teaching on the differences in the gospels this is the discourses revealed luke mark matthew all in order it's a mind blower and you'll see that the truth really is 14 years and a portion above so with that let me start with this one i'm not going to play it i'm just going to read it because it's pretty straightforward This is from, uh, and this is kind of just like a little opener that I want to give you because I think it was shared in the forum, and I just thought it was great. You know, how many times, how many times do we have to see the same storyline being revealed to prove out all of these things that we've revealed from Scripture are being proven out over and over and over and over again so those who want to come against us those you know there was a post in the forum that somebody copied from somebody else's comment that was that was just a flat out attack on me and everything else and you know you, it used to really bother me now you know good you know whatever and the reason i say that is because i know that those people have not taken the time to look into what we revealed if they did, once you see it, you can't unsee it. You have to choose to just say, no, nope, no, nope, forget it. I'm not going to go down that trail. But if you read it, you see the same storyline, the same typologies playing out over and over from colors to descriptions to all of it over and over and over again. And this is another one of those things. The Jonathan Targum. And here's what it says. This is just a little clip of it, okay? And she took of its fruit and did eat, and she gave it to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of both were enlightened, and they knew that they were naked, divested of the purple robe in which they had been created. What? They had been divested of the purple robe. What does divested mean, first of all? Okay, look at what it means. Deprived of power, rights, possessions. So they were deprived or stripped of or relieved of what? They were relieved of their purple robes. Where were they, brothers and sisters? Where were they? Weren't they in paradise? Weren't they in paradise? So they were in paradise wearing purple robes. That when they fell in paradise, they lost their purple covering and they were now naked and in the flesh. 
Well, how about that? You know, these types of things happen all the time. Let me show you an example. You guys know this one. You know, it's our go-to for the revelation of the 14 years. We can do it from creation, as you know. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years. See, this above is 50 days. The in Christ are those in Christ spirit-filled, like you read in Romans 8. And they are the pre-trib, which is like a rapture, like a caught up, which is harpazo. That's the Greek word for rapture. And this is the first group going pre-trib to the third heaven which I believe is August of this year. We've got some great teachings on it. Then you see another group, and this is Paul. Yes, it's Paul referring to things that happened in the is. But when you get prophetic insight and your understanding opens, you realize that prophecy isn't what the Bible, what the, sorry, what uh, pastors tell us, that one third of the Bible is prophecy. <laughs> no, it's way more. Because they didn't realize that, that all throughout the Gospels, it is filled with prophecy with all of those differences in the Gospels. This is another one. This is a prophetic picture also that Paul is giving us. There's first group going pre-trib to the third heaven like a rapture. The second group is, I knew such a man, so not quite in Christ like the first one was, but still with Christ. And this one was caught up. And where do they go? The was caught up goes to, goes to paradise. And then we know, then he says, now it's the third time I'm coming to you. So a taking and a taking and a return. Pre, mid, and the return of the Lord. Paul is a prophetic picture of the end of days in what he's saying here. And so what do we see with the second group, which is the great multitude? They go to paradise. Which group goes to paradise? If we know that Luke is the pre-trib, and in Luke... He, when he's going to the cross, he was arrayed first in a gorgeous robe, it says. Let me show that for new people. He's arrayed in a gorgeous robe. The word gorgeous means, see, bright, clear, gorgeous, white. It's, it's like a bridal gown. When you go to Mark, Mark 15, look at what Mark, the color he was arrayed in. They clothed him with purple. Purple. And then in Matthew, it's scarlet. You ask any pastor, 99.99% .99 of them will tell you scarlet. They didn't even realize when reading there was purple and, and gorgeous. It happens all the time. But Mark's group is the purple. So if Luke is pre, Mark is mid, and Matthew is post, and in Mark, which is the group left behind, which is part of the great multitude rapture, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, tells us that the second group of which is the was caught up great multitude rapture and they're the ones that are in purple and they're going to paradise what did we just read that they were there in paradise as we know they were there in eden and then when they sinned they realized they were naked and they lost their purple robe pretty wild right it's the exact same picture. And we've shown this over and over and over again. And this is yet another one. It's so exciting, guys. Especially when anybody's newer. When anybody's newer and they start to see these things, everything opens up just more and more and more. So now, let's go into 2nd Baruch. Now, in 2nd Baruch, We've gone through, um, this is one of our favorite sections to go in through as well. Now, I'm not going to go in through all of it. and We've gone in through many more of these parts in here. It's, <laughs> the storyline is there. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It says, you know, how long will the tribulation be? Will it take over many years? Will it take, will it seize all the earth? And he says, yes, it'll be the all the earth. And it lists out the things and the events. And it says, you know, some people would say every once in a while, I don't get it too much anymore. But some people say, well, um, you know, you have like, it looks like first seal, one year, second seal, second year, third year, third seal. No, that's not how it plays out. It's that the seven years of seals, there will be the seven seals play out throughout it. But the first seal, the white horse rider, plays in the above the 14 years. 
then the 14 years begin at the red horse rider when jerusalem is attacked the pre-trib has happened 40 days the son of man then jerusalem is attacked and destroyed the jews flee and the land rests for the seven years of seals the lord can't build on that land until it takes its rest for seven years for one cycle for one sabbath cycle then he can rebuild and so what happens is some will continue some will stop just like it says here for these parts of that time are reserved and will be mixed one with another and they will minister to each other for some of these parts will withhold a portion of themselves while taking from others okay meaning the the red horse rider will go the black horse rider will will happen during the same time then maybe the black horse rider stops and the red horse rider is still events going on and then the pale horse rider and they're both going at the same time and so it's not just one two three four five six seven now look at what it says next and again i'm not going to spend a lot of time it's going to make a point for the measure and the calculation of that time is two parts a week of seven weeks well how about that two parts a week of seven weeks so what seven weeks is he talking about he's talking about a jubilee cycle seven sabbaths right seven years 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 and what did he say of the seven parts there's one two that remain that will play out that time it says it right there why people never got it i don't know look at what it says over here it says uh for when the mighty one renews his creation there will be a trial greater than these two tribulations marks and matthews see we're not making this stuff up for all those people that want to come against us it's because they refuse to take the time to seek it out and what's one of the biggest reasons people would refuse to do it they'll have to study and learn a lot more but two everything they thought they understood they're going to have to learn the deeper aspects and length of imagine if you've been teaching you're a prophecy teacher you're a youtuber you're a pastor and you've been teaching these things for decades or for a few years and all of a sudden you're hearing what's being taught here if you accept it and you see it you're going to have to change everything every book you wrote you have to change it all. You're going to rewrite books. You're going to have to reteach these things that, that people thought you were so knowledgeable in. So I get why people don't want to. Because it'll change everything. But I think all of them should, of course. Because when they do, man, oh man, does it all open up and make sense. Here's another great one. Because now as i said it's the story that we're going to get into with uh leviathan and behemoth and we've shared on this so i'm just going to make a point on this one this is um in second baruch 29 verse 4 and behemoth will be revealed from its place and leviathan will rise from the sea and these two great monsters which i created on the fifth day of creation and which i have kept until that time what are they being kept for the time of the end the end of days leviathan and bohemoth are being kept for the time of the end so when it comes now when we go to genesis and we seek this in genesis what is it telling us it says by the fifth day they were created so in the fifth day that they were created now I wanted to show you guys what do what do we know about this creation within days okay there's something we know about this because when we've taught on this when when others have taught on this that you know the males and females that were created in his image the world of church will tell you that this is adam and eve right they'll tell you that this group of of people that were created males and fe male and female created he them the world will tell you that these are the creations of adam and eve why do they do that 
even my wife years ago, I think when she was like 14 years old, she had always wondered and nobody could answer it. And then when this started being revealed and all this stuff started happening to me, she had brought this up and she says, yeah, that's it, honey, that's it. She said it finally made sense to her as it did to so many of us. But why does the world keep saying it's, it's Adam and Eve? Well, because everything they see is through the lens of Matthew. That's why I say it is so vitally, incredibly, wildly important to understand how important it is to realize that every foundational teaching of Scripture has come through the eyes of Matthew. That's, that's the answer to it all. When, when everybody's eyes comes through Matthew, they don't realize that their foundation is Matthew and everything else they read, they try to fit into a Matthew perspective. And so what do they say? End of days is seven years. Creation and the whole story will be 7,000 at the end of the millennial reign. Satan and Lucifer are the same. They're, they're actually the same person. Nope. Okay. They'll, they'll say father and the son. They're, they're, they're actually the same. No, they're two separate beings. So is the spirit working between them. But he's perfect and he's doing exactly what his father said. There's no, there's no space between them. They're in perfect harmony. But there's no way. And, and this is why it gets so difficult to reach people because when they come in and they hear those teachings, they think this is absurdity. You're believing like this group of people. And then they come to another thing and you're believing like that group of people over there. And then and then you're believing. No, it's because this group had some understanding and this group had some understanding and that way had some understanding. But the scriptures, I don't care who, what group, what what denomination believes this and that one believes that and that one believes this. I don't care. I go from the word of God. There is no denomination here. We are seekers of the word. We are diligently seeking, loving, drawing closer to Jesus Christ, the word. And, and the book is opening. It's been opening here for six and a half years. And when you see these things, you'll realize when people are talking things that don't quite line up anymore or, or questions that you would have had over your life that now start to make more sense. You see, we've been told why, you see, when the church all studies from Matthew, and what do the Jews do? Well, the Jews say the same thing. Because, you see, the Christians learn and, and, and get instruction and info from historical things from the Jews, from the Old Testament and other writings, from talking to Jews and rabbis, <coughs> right, when it comes to pastors and so forth. And so when Christians are reading from Matthew as their foundation, and the gospel of Matthew is to Judah, and they're going to Judah for info, they're all seeing as it is 7,000 years. They're not understanding. And you see, this is what's so fascinating. Even the scriptures tell us, in Mark and in Matthew, not in Luke, that in Mark and in Matthew, it says they do err, but not in Luke. Pretty fascinating, right? So what does it mean with this this image, this males and females being created? Well, I'm going to show a clip in a little bit <coughs> that that goes into what we're talking about here tonight and touches on these things. <coughs> Excuse me. That touches on these things. And we're going to, <coughs> of course, expound upon them. But one of the things you're going to hear is is this conversation here. And so you're going to hear this talk of like pre-Adamite. And when you talk about pre-Adamite, people are like, oh, no, no. There was no creation before Adam because. And this lady that you're going to hear, she explains, well, of course, there was. Even if you just look at this case, of course, there was. Even though what she's getting at is there was another pre-Adamite. But what is this created in his image? Why were these males and females created in God's image? Everybody says, see, <clears throat> it's Adam and Eve, and this was the flesh. No. When we realize it, all we have to do is read. Look at how clear it is. You know, I, I, I often say all we have to do is read. Look at the details. 
But I used to be blinded like by, by it just like everybody else. But when the Gospels opened, when, when the years opened and the understanding all started to flow, and we come back to review these things, and we see that on day three of Genesis 1, God said, let there be light, and there was light. This light was Christ. All we have to do is go to John chapter 1, as you guys know, and know that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Christ is the beginning, and Christ is the beginning who created everything that God had him to create, that the Father. So in Christ, God the Father created, because <clears throat> the Father gave everything to the Son. And then what? John says, then John said he was witness to the light. That John wasn't the light, but that he bore witness to the light. Who was the light? Christ. So this is when Christ went from the spirit realm, and then the Father made him light. Obviously, it's not the sun, because the sun and the moon weren't created till later. This is the light that is Jesus when he was made light. So when these males and females were created in his image, they were light beings. Hello. You see how easy it gets after? First portion was spirit. Second portion is light. And then what happens? Well, this light group is going to be going to paradise. Right? And when they go to paradise, what is it? They represent purple. And then after the purple, it goes to the flesh. So what happened with Adam and Eve when they had their purple in paradise? They lost it because of sin. And now what happened? They end up in the flesh, right? They, they realize they were flesh. And, and who does the flesh belong to? Judah. The seven years of trumpets. Theirs is the promise of heaven on earth. The seven years that we're living in a flesh that's theirs. Crazy. I love this stuff. It's so incredible to see. So if this represents the Mark group and, and the, the purple and, and the, those that are being to receive the light of the Lord, then look at what we see on the fifth day. The fifth day is when Leviathan and Bohemoth were created. So then we got to understand, well, who are Leviathan and Bohemoth? Clearly, if they're in the days of creation, then those days of creation, which relate to the Mark group of the seven years of seals, we could probably find more detail. Because we know in the flesh, in the 7,000 years that we're in, that's the portion that relates to trumpets. Now, let's go a little bit further. Let's go into the book of Enoch. And look at what the book of Enoch tells us. This is Enoch, um, do, 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 what chapter? chapter 58, starting in verse 5. It says, And Michael said unto me, Why art thou disquieted with such a vision? Until this day lasted the day of his mercy, and he has been merciful and long-suffering towards those who dwell on the earth. And when the day and the power and the punishment and the judgment come, which the Lord of spirits hath prepared for those who worship not the righteous law and for those who deny the righteous judgment and for those who take his name in vain. Pretty wild, right? In vain. Do you know why in vain is also connected to the purple group with Mark? Those that the light is coming to shine on. It's for the same reason. You see, he made it in our likeness, in our image. This vain show, remember this light being group got corrupted by Lucifer and his guy, you know, his guys that were with him. He's got a main guy with him. And these guys are, of course, represented as you're going to see Bohemoth and Leviathan. So when we come here, we're going to see that vain. Look, look, let me show you this too. The word vain. Do I have it here? Well, that's for later. But the word vain, we've seen clearly just from this creation, this image and made in the likeness of our image, okay? This vain show. So that's one thing. We'll, we'll get to the other part in a bit. But let's keep reading. Uh, um, and for those who take his name in vain, 
that day is prepared for the elect a covenant but for sinners an inquisition when the punishment of the lord of spirits shall rest upon them it shall rest in order that the punishment of the lord of spirits may not come in vain and it shall slay the children with their mothers and the children with their fathers now that sounds harsh doesn't it but is it unexpected no we know what's coming even in luke's discourse in luke's discourse which represents the above portion the a 40 to 50 day period of time and it continues till the end of seals in some insight of it it tells us at the destruction of jerusalem which will happen at the end of the 50 days to start the 14 years you know don't come in flee to the mountains when jerusalem is compassed about and this is what we're seeing the same wording luke 21 22 for these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled but woe unto them that are with child with child and to them that give suck in those days for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and jerusalem shall be trodden down of the gentiles until the times of the gentiles be fulfilled <clears throat> this is from the end of the 50 days when the 14 years begin at the feast of trumpets until the end of the first seven years of seals we're seeing this woe to them the days of vengeance of the lord here the tribulation beginning women with children if if, if they're not in christ if they've lost if they've missed look at what's coming it's not to to put fear except the fear of the lord he's not playing around but for his elect you see afterwards the judgment shall take place according to his mercy and his patience and on that day were two monsters parted were two monsters parted a female monster named leviathan to dwell in the abyss of the ocean over the fountains of waters and the male is named bohemoth who occupied his breast oh uh, his breast a waste wilderness on the east of the garden where the elect and righteous dwell where my father was taken up the seventh from adam who's the seventh from adam enoch enoch you see on the east of the garden where my elect and righteous dwell who are the elect and the righteous do you think luke's group the pre-trib group you know it reminds me one of our brothers uh clive i think will really like this because this is all about the end of days the way the tribes were set up in the wilderness and everything <clears throat> we know this represents the 40 days of the son of man this is him coming at the end of seals as uh, Messiah Ben Joseph, the high priest and king. We're going to talk about that tonight. This is going to blow you away. This is mid-trumpets, and this is when the Lord returns feet down. But what did it just say? It said, where my elect, right? On the east of the garden, where my elect and righteous dwell, where my grandfather was taken up the seventh from Adam. Well, he's talking about Enoch. So Enoch was taken up, and they're in a place on the east. Of the garden right so they're because they're not in the garden they're in the, they're part of the throne room right they're going to the third heaven but why i say our brother clive would like it is because the pre-trib group is taken through the the connection of the pre-trib in the east when the lord comes after the wedding then he's coming as the son of man and when he comes as the son of man we know he's here for 40 days when he comes as the ox we know he's high priest and king the eagle when they fly away on the wings of an eagle into the wilderness and then of course finish with the east again when he returns feet down on the mount of olives so it's a great little connection to show but again what are we really talking about here tonight we're talking about leviathan and bohemoth bohemoth is of the earth and leviathan is in the water in the abyss so you're going to see a great connection with Bohemoth here in a bit. And this thing connected with Leviathan and the abyss. 
Let's go have a look and see what that comes from. If we go to Revelation chapter 13, what do we see? And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Who's over the sea? Leviathan. When we come down into Revelation 13, it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spake like a dragon. Is this the dragon? No. He's empowered by Satan. He's got... <coughs> He speaks like he's Satan, but we know that he's not Satan. We can prove that out, and we will. This, of course, we all know is the false prophet. But you're going to see that there's a connection here that he speaks like a dragon, and you're going to see in another piece where um, he was powered by Satan, which is the dragon. So, of course, we've got three characters. We've got the first beast, which is the beast. We've got the second beast here, which is called the false prophet. We know that very well. We'll be able to show that later. And, of course, we have the dragon. And the dragon's the one who gives these guys their power. <clears throat> so if the dragon is Satan, who's the beast and out of the sea? And who's the beast out of the earth? Well, that's starting to get really clear, isn't it? The beast out of the sea is Leviathan, and the beast out of the earth is Bohemoth. So when we look at this, and we take it a step further, we go to Revelation chapter 9. And in Revelation chapter 9, we see that at the first woe, which is the fifth angel, uh, sorry, which is the fifth trumpet, which is mid-trumpet, so about ten and a half years into tribulation, I saw a star fall from heaven, powers given, uh, given the key to the bottomless pit. Okay? So, the bottomless pit is here, and the bottomless pit is being opened. When the bottomless pit is opened, we know from Revelation 11, who comes out of the bottomless pit. Verse 7 of Revelation 11, And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. So that means the beast is coming out of the bottomless pit. And what is the bottomless pit? Well, it said that Leviathan was in the abyss. You go look at the meaning of bottomless pit. Abyss. Well, how about that? Not too hard to figure out who Leviathan is, right? And also, not too hard to figure out who the other beast is being Bohemoth from the earth. And we, we see these types of things. I mean, you go look and search this up. And you see that bottomless for see the bottomless pit, the pit, the abyss. We see it's all there throughout Revelation. So it's not a mystery to be able to say, oh, okay, that's clearly the one who is out of the ocean, right? Out of the sea. And then what do we see? We go to 2 Thessalonians. And what do we see in 2 Thessalonians? You see, 2 Thessalonians isn't the same as what we read in Revelation 13. Because in Revelation 13, we see that he's taking power, he's going after the, the saints, he's going to be able to kill them and, and defeat them. We know when this beast comes out of the earth at about the same time, he's going to get everybody to worship the first beast, and it's going to be the time of the mark of the beast. That's not what we're reading about when we go to 2 Thessalonians. When we go to 2 Thessalonians, we read, starting in verse 3, and this is something that a lot of people get confused with as well. And, and the number one reason people get so confused over this, a little coffee, the number one reason people get so confused with 2 Thessalonians, believe that it's coming now, is because of the timing. They haven't understood that like we have in the Ministry Revealed book. You can download it for free from the website. It's in links under the videos. Um, you can listen to it. it. It's downloadable in PDF in five languages. And you can listen to the audio for free on the website. You can read the book from the website. And if you want a paperback or digital, then you can go to Amazon. But what people haven't realized is that the seven churches that are in the book of Revelation 
They have never yet understood how they play out in the end of days. We here have revealed it. We've known it now for a few years. We've spoken on it. We've taught on it for a long time. And it's in the book from, geez, almost four years ago. Four years? We wrote it in 2020? Oh, my goodness. That went fast looking at it that way. So what do we know about it? Well, we know that Laodicea is the apostate church, right? Is the falling away church. So because we're in it now, <clears throat> the church of the world thinks that because we're in it now, then what we're reading in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 must be for now. You see? But they haven't understood how the seven churches play out in the end of days. That this is the beginning right after the pre-trib. There's your beginning of 50 days. There's your beginning of 40 after the one-week wedding. And all the way to the end of the 14 years of tribulation. We revealed it here. What was, what is, shall be. We've, it, it's so incredible when you understand it. <clears throat> and this is why they get confused and try to tell you this is connected to now. But we know it's impossible that this can be now because it's the time of the son of perdition. And the son of perdition doesn't show up as the son of perdition until he comes out of the pit. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Look at how cold it is here. We got a huge cold snap again. Minus 21 Celsius. Another day or so, and then we're we're all good. Back to the nice weather. Um, so that's probably a little bit of my coughing a bit more today. Anyways, so this is why they get confused. Because they haven't understood the seven churches in the end of days to realize that this is mid-trumpets. It has no connection to now. So look at what it says. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 is where we'll start. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, okay? Who exalt, who exalt, oh, sorry, who opposeth and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, okay? First of all, people don't understand when the temple is going to be built yet, let alone when this is going to happen in mid-trumpets. But we know it won't last forever because then we're told in verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. With the brightness of his coming. That's really interesting because the one who's who he's destroying at this point, which is at the end of tribulation, right? We all remember this word. The Greek word 34, uh, 3952 is the word for when the Lord returns in Matthew 24 is the only place you find it is when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives and he's going to destroy the son of perdition and the false prophet, as we know. And the false prophet is that second beast from the earth who is Bohemoth. It even tells us right here in verse uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. Even him who's coming is after the working of Satan. Whose working was I just talking about was after the working of Satan? Bohemoth. The one out of the land. The one from the earth. And the one from the earth, it said that he spoke like a dragon. Because this signs and power and lying wonders that he's giving that's the giveaway we know that this is the beast of revelation 13 that from the earth who is the false prophet so when is christ going to destroy the beast who is leviathan and destroy the beast who is the false prophet he's going to do it at his coming so to understand when he's going to do it at his coming which is when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, when he's going to tread them all, like the treading of the wine press of the grapes of wrath. Look what happens. Who are the first two taken? Revelation 1920. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet. How do you know the false prophet was the beast, the second beast from the earth in Revelation 13? It tells you that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived those who received the mark and so forth. Hello. 
There it is right there. So that means this beast is the Revelation 13, Leviathan beast. And this, be this false prophet is the beast in Revelation 13 from the earth. One is Leviathan. One is Bohemoth. And Satan gives some sort of incredible power to this one, which is the false prophet. But we understand, and we're going to see again who this beast is, who this first beast is as well. <clears throat> and we just saw how in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when he wants to exalt himself above God into the heavens to where God sits in the temple, we're going to see these things revealed in Scripture that tells us who this first beast is. Or who this, yeah, the, the first beast in Revelation 13 is. We know who the second one is. But we're also going to get more insight into this second one as well. So now you can understand. This is when the pit is opened. Because the son of perdition doesn't show up until he comes out of the pit. Now, was he already here in another form? Yes. But he becomes the son of perdition when the pit is opened and he comes out of it. Which means this period of this falling away doesn't happen until the midpoint of trumpets. Of the trumpet judgments, which is ten and a half years into tribulation. But again, we're seeing that there are two of them. The one Leviathan and the other Bohemoth. Let's keep going. Revelation 17. Again, a great place we've gone into and taught many times. And how do we know what takes place here? How is it that if the beast was already here, Leviathan was here, and yet he's gone and, and he's got to come out of the pit? Well, you guys know this very well, unless you're newer. We're told it in Revelation chapter 17. In verse 8, it says, The beast that thou sawest was... That's the, that's the second half of seals. Remember how Bohemoth and Leviathan were created in the days of creation? Those days of creation represent those seven days, represent the seven years of seals. The, the 7,000 of the flesh from Adam represent the 7,000 of the Jews of the seven years of trumpets. We've shared on it many times. In fact, if you're newer and you've gone through that intro series, just keep watching the videos. And by the time you get to the last one called It's All a Fractal, get ready for your head to explode. But don't watch all of those videos at once. You need to study them out. <clears throat> and I promise you it'll be worth it. So now listen to what it says. The beast that thou sawest was and is not. So he was because we know in the second half of seals he's here. Then something happens where he's not during what? The first half of trumpets. And then it says, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Huh. Who ascends out of the bottomless pit? The one who's over the bottomless pit? And then what? It says, and goes into perdition. Which means when he's here the first time in the was, which is the about second half of seals, he's not quote unquote officially the son of perdition yet. Because he doesn't go into perdition until he comes out of the pit. And he doesn't come out of the pit until the first woe, when that angel comes down and has the key and opens the pit. That's when. The beast who was will now come back again and will be called the son of perdition. This is how we clearly know. Now, let anybody try to reveal to you just this verse in prophecy, in any prophecy circle. Go to listen to anybody that tries to explain was, is not, and shall be. It's impossible to do it in a seven-year period impossible when you understand the the counts and the numbers in scripture 42 months 1260 and then time and times and half a time that's the second half of seals the first half of trumpets and the second half of trumpets 42 months 1260 time and times and half a time 
Why do you think they were given to us in three different formats? That's why. So now you can see where this son of perdition, how we could have gone and yet come back. Okay, well, well, how did he end up gone, right? Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. We read that the beast, who is this fourth beast, the one that has the ten horns, he's now the fourth beast. He is the eighth of the seven. And what does he do? He gets killed at the end of the sixth year of seals. The Lord's coming on heavenly Mount Zion with paradise to receive the Mark group, the great multitude rapture, the purple group into paradise. And what happens? It says, uh, da, 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 verse 11, Daniel 7, 11, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame as concerning the rest of the beasts they had their dominion taken away and their lives were prolonged for a season and time. So what do we see? This is where the beast is killed at the end of seals. And it goes on to explain it. It gives you the interpretation of the vision. It says, um, until the ancient of days came and judgment came, that the saints possessed the kingdom. Well, remember in, in Revelation 13, it says here is the patience of the saints because they were being killed, right? It's during the time of seals, about mid-seals, and the Antichrist is here, and the false prophet, which is the beast and, and the, out of the sea, and the beast out of the, out of the earth, Leviathan and Bohemoth, and what happens? They're given over, they're being killed, right? They're being beheaded, and it says, and the fourth beast shall be the fourth one of the kingdom, is, shall be the great, uh, he shall tread and break it into pieces, the ten horns are out of them and came out, and the one da, 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 wear out the saints. Um, right here, verse 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and shall be given unto him until a time, times, and a dividing of time. This is not the same. This is to the end of seals. It's the dividing of time. The Gentile age is over at the end of seals and it goes back now to Judah. But the judgment shall sit. Uh, let's see. It talks about when he goes after... Um, the same horn should go after the saints prevail. Yeah, until until the Ancient of Days came and the judgment of the saints. So we see here that the beast comes with his people, like those ten horns, right? And they're going to come to fight against the Lord, which we know is the end of six years of seals. So the point in this was to show that the beast is killed. That's how you know he is the was. And when he's killed, where is he going? He's going to the abyss. Now, it says she in that other translation, whether in that apocrypha, whether it's a she or he, it'll be understood at, those, at that time. But we see that the beast is killed. This is how you know the beast is killed, yet he was here in the, first half, the second half of seals. He's killed. He's not here for the first half of trumpets. And then when the pit is opened, he comes back again. Okay? It's something we've talked on and shared on a number of times. Again. When we see now what happens, we just covered this a little while ago, you know, at the treading of the wine press of, of that final year, that 14th year when the Lord has returned feet down, the first ones that go into the lake of fire are beast one and beast two, the one out of the sea and the one out of the earth. They're cast alive this time, not into the pit, but the lake of fire. Now look what happens when we go to Job. I had a... I believe it was a brother. I can't recall right off the top of my head, but I believe a brother, somebody who's been watching for years that reached out to say hello and, and wanted to share uh, uh, Job uh, 1 for me to look at. And it how fitting for the timing, right? He knew that there was something the Lord was prompting him to, and here it is. It was great. I love to hear from people send me a little note or something to say they've been watching for years, never contacted, never, I didn't know they, they were watching. You know, there's, Thousands of people like that uh, that I don't know. So it's always nice when we get to hear from one. So here's from Job 1. Look now what happens as we shift some of this attention to including Satan a little bit more in this. Now there was a day 
when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And here the Lord, the Father, is speaking to Satan. Wait a second. This is something I shared about in the in the live show that we did um, in the last video. We did a live, so if you're looking for it, just click on the live tab on YouTube, and you could watch it. And part of the conversation was a question on this that I said I was going to share in this video today. And that's because we've all been told that Satan is Lucifer, like I was talking about earlier. We've all been told that it's not 14 years or even a bigger picture, which is 21 to 22 but we've all been told it's only been seven years of trip will be seven years of tribulation. It's only been 7,000 years when it's all done. That Satan is Lucifer. And I keep saying, no, we can show that Satan isn't Lucifer. We know Satan hasn't officially been kicked out of heaven yet. Lucifer has. Okay. Let me show you this clip that I was telling you guys about that I wanted to show you. I'm going to play two short clips in this part. And then um, I'm going to save the other part for uh, when we get a little bit further. But let's have a listen to this. And I need to turn down the speed. See, I remembered, guys. I'm remembering. Scripture's one thing. Everything else is another. So now listen to what he says. And I'm, agree I'm in agreement with him. But he was called like, like a heretic for believing this. Imagine what we get called. Man, if you guys knew what I got called. <laughs> you wouldn't want to do what I do. <laughs> so let's have a listen to what it, what he says here. So Derek, what do you make of the link between Satan, Lucifer, reptiles, and the serpentine? <laughs> well, this is what got me called a uh, heretic. In fact, uh, this this came up on a on a another television program here recently. We we were made aware of it. Somebody asked about the book, and it was dismissed as stupid <laughs> um, <laughs> because I concluded that Lucifer <laughs> is not Satan that it is the leader of the Watchers oh, wow. described in the book of First Enoch, that Shemiyaza, who is described as the chief of the Watchers, the sons of God from Genesis chapter 6, is the character identified in Scripture as Lucifer, which is a translation of the Hebrew, Haleel ben Shekhar. Mm -hmm. A scholar named William R. Gallagher about 30 years ago wrote a paper and said that Haleel is actually the West Semitic, read Hebrew, transliteration of the Akkadian god Elil or Enlil mm -hmm. who was the creator god of Mesopotamia whose temple by the way is where Ezekiel got his vision of the throne mm. room of God you see that so just in that one piece he understands who Lucifer is and that Lucifer differs from Satan and we're going to see this even when we start to get into the description of things it becomes very clear I mean, it should already start to be clear. We can see that there's three characters, and we know there's the beast, the false prophet, and Satan. Satan gives them the power. Well, think about it in the way of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You have the Father who gives the power to the Son, and he gives the Son authority over everything. And then he's going to give his Son the kingdom. Satan's trying to usurp that and do the same with Lucifer, his guy. And then he's got this behemoth false prophet guy who is trying to, to, to get everybody stirred up to see these wonderful things that he's going to do, these miracles, so that people will believe him. Whereas the Spirit is using people and doing these things through Christ to make these things take place that the Father wills on the righteous side. So now you're seeing that he was part of the Watchers. And we know that those Watchers fell. Right? Not all of them, but we know some of them fell. And who was the leader of the Watcher? Lucifer. Lucifer was. So when they were making these in their image and being as beings of light and then corrupted them, it was Lucifer. It was Leviathan. Lucifer, Leviathan with Bohemoth that corrupted them. Now listen to this. We're going to go to this next piece. I'm going to save you the, the, the wow factor one to the end, of course. But let's go to this next one. It keeps switching over on me. Let me move this over. All right, 30 to 22. All right. Now let's see what she has to say here. Race. Now, 
understand, I got to qualify this, the pre-Adamic race, when people hear pre-Adamites or a pre-Adamic race, naturally everybody cringes. That's there for two reasons. First of all, it, it, there's this idea that, well, humans didn't exist before Adam. So when you say pre-Adamic race, are you talking about humans before Adam? Because obviously Adam was the first human and the Bible is clear. No, we're not talking about humans before the time of Adam, at least not the humans that would have been made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. Second of all, we are not talking. So right off the bat, I mean, you could see she's understanding there was a creation before the fleshly of Adam and Eve, right? Before Adam. But then she says, you know, in the image of. Why? Because she hasn't understood that the image of was light beings because Christ was made light in verse 3 of Genesis 1. And if he was made light, then those beings, those males and females that were created in Genesis 1, had to be light beings because they were being made in his image. You see? So that's the part she hasn't gotten. Most of the church, virtually nobody has gotten that yet either. But... She understands that there was this pre-Adamic group. And she said, and then she's going to go in, as you're going to see, and say that at the very least, we can understand that there is a type of pre-Adamic group. And that's what she talks about. Now, it's because she's not going into it to say, well, look, there is this other pre-Adamic group. But she's saying it in a way that people can understand by saying, look, he created angels before he created humans. So there was a pre-group before Adam, right? Talking about this very popular conspiracy theory that intergalactic space travelers at some point uh, were more intelligent than us and they made Earth and then they made us and we all belong to the aliens and we have the aliens to thank for how where we came from. These are the reasons why when most biblical scholars hear the question of a pre-Adamic race or pre-Adamites, they say there is no way that the Bible could ever allow for an interpretation where there would be a pre-Adamic race. No, I'm sorry. Take away the astronauts for a moment. And take away the idea that there was ever a human made in the image of God before Adam's time. The Bible actually forces the idea of a pre-Adamic race, and here's how. Angels were created before Adam. The Bible's clear about that, right? Mm -hmm. All angels were beings of extreme intelligence. The Bible is also clear about that. Uh, let's go with the third for a moment. A third of them fell, becoming evil, and when they did, earth was their home. So there was a pre-Adamic race on earth before the time of Adam. Now okay, so that's, that's an interesting way. I wanted to share that because I thought that was an interesting way that even if people don't want to believe that there, there was this pre-Adamic in Genesis 1 of males and females, and even though she herself said in the image that it couldn't have been that it had to be, you know, with Adam and Eve, it's like she's she's mixing the two because she still hasn't quite fully seen the clarity that there is indeed a pre-Adamic and they were light beings and they weren't the watchers that were cast down first because they were involved in creating those light beings or involved in the process, not creating the light beings. That was the Lord because they were created in his image. But then they taught them things and they corrupted them and so forth. And as we know, that's the purple group. That's the Mark group. That's why we can see and then we see Adam, and he's in paradise, and Adam's in paradise, and what ends up happening? Once he falls, the purple covering that he realized that he had is now gone. Pretty wild how that works, right? Those that were in paradise, those that were Jesus's for paradise, that he would receive unto himself, there he was, that when he returns, he's going to receive them unto himself, that's them. But she she tells us in a way where you can at least understand your mind can start to say, okay, clearly there was, I mean, angels, they were smarter, they were created before the flesh, and they fell, so there was a group on the earth pre-Adam, okay? So, in a sense, she, she's trying to open up people's understanding that there at least was something, there was a creation of beings here already, but the deeper portion of that is that those males and females were the light beings that were created, in the image of God. That's what was happening. So yes, there was the light beings created and then there were the flesh beings created. And Jesus' Mark group, those who are the lost sheep of the house of Israel, are the typology of those people. Not the They're not reincarnated and now here they are in the flesh. That's not what I'm saying. They're the same type. Like what was, what is, shall be. So that was group is a typology of those who are in the sleeping church, in the world, that Jesus is coming to save. 
in the time of seals. They're the mark group. Okay? So again, something we've touched on, but I wanted to share that to see this pre-edemic. You know, this is what we're talking about. There is this pre-edemic portion, which is the portion of, uh, of this light group, which is the mark group, which is the time when Bohemoth and Leviathan are here in the second half of seals. When it's the time of what? The mark of the beast, right? It's when the, the mark of the beast time comes. It's the portion that belongs to Mark. Okay, we'll touch on that as we go forward a little bit as well. So let's keep going. So we saw in Job 1, here Satan is, walking to and fro through the earth, going up and down. We see in Job chapter 40, we now get the info on Bohemoth. So in Job 40, verse 15, Behold, be Bohemoth, which I made with thee, he eats grass as an ox. Okay? Uh, stones were out together. Listen to this. Verse 18. His bones are strong as pieces of brass, and his bones are like bars of iron. Sounds pretty interesting, doesn't it? A portion of him is brass or bronze when you go look at it, and iron. Reminds me of something, doesn't it? How about this? The image of gold, right? The image of Nebuchadnezzar. It's no different than the beast and the ten horns as the ten toes and all of that. So what do we see? In Daniel chapter 2, verse 32, this image's head was of fine gold, his breast and arms were of silver, and his belly and thighs of brass so his belly and thighs are of brass his legs are of iron so here we have the bohemoth beast being explained to us as having a picture being part of brass and part of iron i thought that was an interesting connection i haven't gone deeper down into that section to see where it leads yet but i can tell you that's why i said in the beginning there will be more things that will continue to develop. Now let's go to Job 41. Check this out with Job 41. In Job 41, it says, can, can thou draw out Leviathan with a hook or his tongue with a cord, which thou let us down, right? He's telling all these things to Job. Now listen to this. In verse 13, it says, who can discover the face of his garment or who can come to him with his double bridle? With his double bridle. Let's go have a look and see what that word means. Okay. Job chapter 41. There's Leviathan. Okay. And Leviathan, of course, Remember, Leviathan is especially like a crocodile. He's a sea monster, right? Can be as a serpent. He's not the dragon. But remember, you're going to see that he is Lucifer. And Lucifer is like, quote unquote, the son of the dragon. Okay? So it's like, it's like his guy, like the father with the son. And look at what, what else is it? Of course, it's a symbol of Babylon. So we have Leviathan here. And it says, who can discover the face of his garment or who can come to him with his double bridle? Look at this, double. To duplicate. To duplicate. To repeat. What on earth is there a double bridle? Right? Putting what? This, this bridle in the jaw. Because he's going to do something twice. Huh, he's going to do something twice. Where did we hear of that before? Right? Th does it sound familiar that he's going to do something twice? Here, let's go, let's go back a couple of pieces of scripture here. How about Revelation 17? When it talks about the beast that was, is not, 
and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. He's what? He's the beast that was, is not, and yet is when he will ascend out of the bottomless pit. Who ascends out of the bottomless pit? Leviathan, the one from the abyss. But he was already here once. Notice how the conversation in Job here, even going into Job chapter 40, going back one, how Bohemoth, it doesn't say that, that he's gone away to do something and then he's brought back for a second time. Notice how it doesn't say that, right? You know why that's so interesting? I found this, when I saw this, I was like, what? It was perfect. And why is it perfect? Because it's something we've shared, just like I showed you in Revelation 17. We know exactly what that portion means. But when we go to the discourses, we know it even more clear. Because remember, Bohemoth doesn't have a conversation of going away and then coming back and doing something again. Yet Leviathan does. So when we go into Luke's discourse, you guys will all know what I'm talking about. There is no mention of false Christ or false prophet. When we go to Mark's discourse, this is the evidence for you guys. When I discovered this, I can't remember how many years ago now, maybe four years ago or more. It was one of those just wow moments because it does many things. It, it proves the discourses in just a simple way. It proves the discourses go Luke, Mark, Matthew. I mean, so do the colors, so do many other things. So we know it goes Luke, Mark, Matthew because of this. We know that it proves out what Revelation 17 is saying, that he was, is not, and shall be, and that it was only about the beast who is Leviathan, but not the beast who is of the earth, Bohe excuse me, Bohemoth. And how do we know that? Okay, well, if Luke's discourse is the pre-trib, and the, the above portion, which is the 50-day period, then we come to the beginning of the 14 years. And that's Mark's discourse. Verse 8, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That's the red horse rider. There's going to be famines and earthquakes and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. This right here is the first about two and a half years of tribulation. And they're going to be taken up to councils and and some of them beaten and so forth for a testimony. But look at what you don't see. Before the abomination of desolation in Mark's discourse, you still don't see the false Christ and the false prophet. There's still no mention. Why? Because the was isn't all of seals. It's about the second half of seals, about two and a half years in to the end of the sixth seal. It's his 42 months that you read when he's given power to continue 42 months in Revelation chapter 13. And what happens in Revelation 13? You got the time of what? Now you have an abomination of desolation taking place, standing where it ought not, which can also mean placed. Okay? It can mean placed where it ought not or abiding where it shouldn't it's all about the mark of the beast we've done some great videos on this talking about how this abomination in mark's discourse is the abomination as moses's temple because the temple of moses was a portable temple covered in flesh what are you you see during the time of the gentiles like luke's discourse said until the time of the gentiles is fulfilled well, the time of the Gentiles is till the time of the end of seals, which means the temple of God is still within. So this abomination of desolation in Mark is all about the mark of the beast. And so here now comes this abomination conversation. It says now it's going to be a worse time than it ever was since creation unto this time. And then what? Now you see false Christ and false prophets show up. Pretty fascinating, right? Because this is the point where the false prophet and the false Christ show up. This is where Bohemoth and Leviathan show up at about mid-seals. This is the Revelation 13, Bohemoth and 
Leviathan. Beast one and beast two, or or Antichrist, if you want to say, and false prophet. Fascinating, right? They weren't there in the first half, but they are in the second half. And then here's the Son of Man coming in the clouds, plural. Literally in the clouds, plural. Okay? But now watch this. Now for me to prove to you that Matthew is a second separate set of seven years, let's go to Matthew chapter 24 and see how trumpets plays out. Look at this. Okay? Nation against nation. Because remember, they're removed at the very beginning. And look at this. Only false prophets are mentioned. Remember what I said? In, in Job 40, there is no mention about Bohemoth, who we know is the false prophet from the earth. <coughs> There's no mention that Bohemoth has to do something again. Why? Because Bohemoth isn't killed. Bohemoth goes right here from about mid-seals and goes through to the end of trumpets with the, with the Antichrist who at the end, at the 14th year, are the first two cast into the lake of fire. But remember how I showed in Daniel chapter 7, we know that the beast was killed at the end of the sixth year of seals. So if he's killed at the end of the sixth year of seals, but the false prophet isn't, and we know <coughs> that the beast, who's Leviathan, has to, has to somehow end up coming out of, out of the bottomless pit, Yet he was already here. How fascinating to see that only the false prophet is here in the first half of Trump. It's probably out somewhere hiding. Why is it fascinating? Because then you come to the abomination of desolation in Matthew. And this one says, stand in the holy place. Because this is mid-trumpet's time. Which is ten and a half years into tribulation approximately. And what had happened? The first half of trumpets, the temple was rebuilt. The city, the streets, the wall, and the temple were rebuilt in the first half of trumpets. <clears throat> and who do we know? Who do we know wants to come and stand in the holy place and declare himself God? And we're told that now this time is going to be even worse than at any other point since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. You see, Matthew's second half of trumpets is even worse than the second half of seals. And look who shows up. All of a sudden, there's false Christ again with false prophets. You know why? For exactly what I shared. Because the false Christ, the beast of Revelation 13, is here for 42 months, the second half of seals. He's killed at the end of seals when the Lord comes. And the Lord is here, the city and the streets and the temple get rebuilt. At mid-trumpets, Satan is cast down. Satan loses his battle in heaven. And Satan is cast down. The pit is open. And who comes back? The false Christ, the Antichrist, the beast, Leviathan. This is why in Job... Chapter 41, we see that he had a double bridle because he had to do something again. He had to repeat something. Pretty crazy, right? It's right there in their definition. His teeth are terrible, right? Sound familiar, somebody? The terrible teeth, right? His teeth of iron. His scales are his pride All right listen to this by his nestings or nestings which means sneeze kind of interesting by his sneezing a light does shine and his eyes are like eyelids of the morning he does shine and his eyelids are of are like eyelids of the morning, which is like light. Wait a second. Is this Christ? No, of course it's not Christ. Of course it's not Christ. Who's the one that had this beautiful shining radiance about him? Lucifer, of course. Right? 
Lucifer who had this shining light. Lucifer was the one made so beautiful and brilliant light. This is what you're starting to see now. You're starting to be able to see that Lucifer is the first beast who is Leviathan. Hence, being cast into the sea and hence being from the abyss. You're going to see this continue to develop. Job 41, 24. His heart is as firm as a stone. Yea, uh, as hard as a piece of of the nether millstone when he raiseth up himself the mighty are afraid by reason of breakings they purify themselves i needed to show you something else too so what do we see here this is why i brought this up a moment like a few minutes ago look at his shining Okay, we know that Lucifer, this shining being, this most adorned being who was a cherub. And this most adorned being who is the beautiful radiance of shining. When we saw in Second Thessalonians. When when he goes to the when he's cast down into the pit and he comes back. What does it say when he comes from the pit? Okay, here he is now the son of perdition. Coming back from the pit, he's going to try to exalt himself above all that is God to sit in the temple of God because the temple will have been finished now. And when Christ comes to destroy him, the wicked one, when Christ comes to destroy the wicked one, and it's at his, the what? He's going to destroy him what? With the brightness of his coming. This is what I was talking about earlier. So at the end of trumpets, at the end of the 13th year, to start the 14th year, when the Lord comes feet down on the Mount of Olives as lightning from one end unto the other, the one who believes himself to be so bright and he was so arrogant, so prideful in his beauty that he was cast out. The true beauty, which is the Lord, with his glorious brightness, is going to destroy that brightness when he comes with his, com with his coming. We're going to see more of this conversation as we continue forward as well. I just want to make sure I'm not missing something. I see even this word pride. So we see a lot of this, of course, with Lucifer and what? His pride. Right? He had all this beauty and everything and he got filled with this pride. Now what happens? Let's go look up the word pride. Do you know where the pride is in the New Testament? Only in Mark. Only in Mark. Funny how that works. When the prideful one, Lucifer, Lucifer being the first beast who is the Antichrist, trying to take everything from Christ, whereas, the, whereas Satan is trying to overcome it to take everything that belongs to the Father by giving it through to Lucifer. And he was what? In the portion of the days of creation, which relates to the Mark group. And there's that word pride. Just an interesting side note. So now when we see this and we're going to see where Satan, where Lucifer is cast down. And we saw when it came to Satan that in Job chapter one. We saw that he can go up and down to and fro and yet still be before the Lord. We can go to Joshua, uh, Zechariah chapter 3, which we know is also prophetic for the end of days. And we know that Joshua is a picture of Jesus, who is the high priest. And it says, and he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right side to resist him. And the Lord, this is the father, said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, Satan even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem, rebuke thee. Where's Satan? Here's Satan in heaven again. Satan was in heaven in Job. Satan is in heaven in Zechariah. He can come and go. He can go up. He can go down. He can go side to side across the earth. It's not until we get to Revelation chapter 12 in verse 9 
after he lost his fight against Michael and his angels, we know this is what I was talking about in the live show. We know this is the end of days. This isn't something that already happened. This is why I'm talking about this because when I realized it was like, it was like such a, a simple epiphany that I was like, duh, of course, of course this makes sense. You know, all this time we we've known for the last quite a while that Lucifer is separate from Satan, yet they work together as partners. Okay, like the father and the son. This is the opposite to try to usurp all of it. We know this and wait till you see what's coming. The usurping is even more directly prophetically connected than we've already talked about and shared over the last couple of years about this. So we've again, because what are we showing here? What are we what are we talking about? We're showing about another one of those things that this misunderstanding of everybody's foundation of Matthew has caused. This shows the difference between Lucifer and Satan again. Because this great dragon, who is the old serpent called the devil and Satan, is now cast out. He loses his battle. He is going to be fighting against Michael and his angels with the devil and his angels during the second half of trumpets. This battle is going to be going on I don't know if it's going to be seen something in the heavens. I don't know if it's just going to be spiritual until he's cast down. But he hasn't been cast down yet. Lucifer doesn't get to keep going back and forth into heaven. Lucifer has already been cast out. It's Satan who hasn't been yet cast out. And we can prove it. First of all, when you understand that this is prophetic here in Revelation chapter 12, but we're going to prove it even further by the rest of it. In verse 10, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser, that's when you go click on it, it's the word for Satan, the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. Clearly, for him to be accusing the brethren who are in Christ means he had to be doing it after Christ's death and resurrection. Which means he still isn't cast down. He can come and up and down. He can go left and right. He can be in the throne room, right? Because he's there accusing the brethren whenever we do something wrong, the Lord points and uh, um, uh, Satan accuses and points and says, yeah, look what he did. This is your guy. You've got this guy. You've got this sister here. And you've got them always protected. Yet look what they did. And he's there always accusing. How could he be kicked out of heaven, yet always being there accusing the Lord, uh, accusing us to the Lord, the Father, yet be kicked out of heaven? Hello. The only way you can comprehend this is through the difference of Lucifer and Satan. Uh, besides everything else we've already covered. So he's what? He's uh, uh, the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. So again, clearly during the is that we're living in right now, but it also knowing this is tribulation time, it's also those who were sacrificed and dying during the time of seals in the blood of the lamb. And by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. Rejoice, therefore rejoice ye heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. Because he knows. That he has but a short time. Brothers and sisters, what is that short time? You know what it is, right? What is the short time that Lucifer, uh, that Satan has? Well, we all know it. Daniel chapter 12 in verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, 
which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. No and between time and times, which means one, two, plus a half. Two and a half years. Satan's short time that he has is two and a half of the final three and a half years in the at the end of the 14 years which means at the end of his two and a half years it brings us to the end of the 13th year of tribulation or the end of the sixth trumpet leaving one more year which is what when the lord said that he would return and crush them all under his feet as he would tread upon them which is the treading of the wine grapes of the wrath of god hello what did he say? It goes on, scatter the power of the holy people. All these things shall be finished. Well, we know what that finished is too. Again, something we've shared a number of times. Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10 says in verse 5, and the angel, uh, swear by him forever. Verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, this is the one with the seventh trumpet, when he shall begin to sound the mystery of god should be finished why is the mystery finished because it's the lord coming down as lightning from one end unto the other feet down on the mount of olives so now when we go back to revelation 12 and you're trying to and people are trying to say well no no this is actually when satan was cast down a long time ago by michael no, it isn't. They don't understand prophecy if they try to tell you that. They're telling you, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, woe for the short time that he has. Do you know what I've heard, and I'm sure many of you had, <coughs> is that when they ever try to say or explain a short time, they say, well, in God's eyes. You know, a thousand years is like a day. So it's really just a short time. Or they'll say, in the end of days. And they try to tell us that the end of days began when Christ's death and resurrection. When the Holy Ghost came, that began the end of days. It's the craziest thing I've ever heard. It has to be applicable to us. But because there is no or very little prophetic understanding in the 90% of the churches, and those that do have some prophetic understanding in, in, in end time prophecy, and they're jumbled up, they can't account for what these things mean throughout Scripture. When you're reading some of these things, you know, for the time of the end, and you're reading it like in a gospel, then you read and you say, well, because it's there in Luke, it must be that, you know, the real thing is that a day is a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. So these last 2,000 years are really like two days. So that's why he's saying the end of the day, end of days, because it's only two days left. No, that's not what's going on. There is an understanding for us once we understand prophecy in how those things apply to us in relation to understanding them in the end of days. Everybody knows this is prophetic. Satan hadn't been cast down yet. He was Lucifer. We even know by when he goes to persecute the woman, goes after her, uh, chases her into the wilderness where she's protected for what? a time and times and half a time because when they go into the wilderness this group flying away on the wings of an eagle when they go at that point that's they're going to be there safe until the end of the 14th year but in that final year why don't they why doesn't the lord bring them back after satan's time is done because it's the year of the vengeance of the lord it's when he's going to tread them in the wine press of the wrath of almighty god from revelation 19 when at this point, the beast, as we know, and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire at the treading of the grapes. We all know this is prophetic. So when you understand this timing, and we know that the short space of time that he has is Daniel chapter 12, and that it relates from about mid-trumpets, ten and a half years into tribulation, and he has two and a half, which brings you to 13 years. It now makes sense. 
this short time had nothing to do with 2,000 years ago. It doesn't even make sense. Do you understand? It doesn't even make sense to say that from 2,000 years ago. Because he's not cast out yet. He's accusing. He's still accusing. How could he be accusing the brethren of those who believe in the Lamb of God, who worship the Lamb, who have his testimony, who are dying for him, and yet he was cast out back then? No, he wasn't cast out yet. He isn't cast out yet. He is the accuser going up and down, to and fro. Let's go to Ezekiel now and see what Ezekiel tells us. In Ezekiel, we get more of this understanding in relation to, of course, Lucifer. So Ezekiel chapter 28. And right off the bat in verse 2, about halfway through, it says, uh, I am a God. So this is about Lucifer, right? And he's saying, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God. In the midst of, well, look at that, in the midst of the seas. Who do we know is from the sea? Yeah, you got it. Yet thou art a man and not God. Okay? Uh, we see it again. Listen to this. Uh, 28, verse 7. Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom and shall defile thy brightness. There's his brightness again, which Christ in his brightness will destroy at the end. And look at this, verse 8. They shall bring thee down to the pit. They're going to bring them down to the pit. Isn't that exactly what happens? He's got to be brought down to the pit to be what? brought out of the pit you see and so what do we see he's going to sit on the seat of god but it says in the midst of the seas that's interesting this one's talking about in the midst of the seas and it goes on again and it says um out of the pit uh da -da -da -da, that thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas <laughs> it gets pretty clear, doesn't it? Let me see. See, thou art the anointed cherub that covers, right? So we know he was a cherub, where Satan is a seraphim. So again, something else we know. And we've understood for a bit. Let me see what else. If there was something particular, the anointed cherub, thy brightness... So again, we're seeing him connected to the sea. We know it's his brightness. We know in this one he's talking about seating uh, uh, in the seat of God, but in the midst of the seas. And, and it being in the midst of the seas is very interesting because in the midst of the seas relates to what? Seals. Seals. Because he's coming up from the sea. We've got him as his brightness. We know this is Lucifer. And when he dies, he's going to be cast into the pit, which is at the end of seals. Now watch what happens. <clears throat> Again, I believe what we're seeing there is a first connection to when he's here as the was. Okay? Then we know he is not during the first half of trumpets. And now let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14. How art, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. You see, Lucifer doesn't go back and forth. He doesn't get to go into heaven all the time. Only Satan does. How thou art fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How thou art cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations. Um, for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Wait a second. Now he's talking about exalting above the stars of God. He didn't say that in Ezekiel. He was talking about the seas and the throne of God of the seas. And here 
He's talking about he's exalting himself above God in the stars. So what are we seeing in this one? We're seeing a different type, aren't we? We're seeing the one of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is why I was saying earlier, when does he become the son of perdition? When the pit is open at the fifth trumpet, which is mid trumpets, which is uh, about 10 and a half years in the tribulation. And what is he going to do? Above all that is called God, so they worship him, uh, uh, so that he sitteth in the temple of God, showing that he is God. So there's no mention here of sitting in the seas, uh, uh, on the seas and, and the, over the, the throne and the seas and so forth. This is in relation to God and the temple of God and being as God. So what else do we see? Watch this. Uh, da, 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 da. Verse 17, that made the world as a wilderness. So this is about him. That made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of the prisoners. All the kings of the nations, even all them lie in glory, every one in his own house. Now listen to this. But thou art cast out of thy grave. What? Let's go look at that. In, where are we? Isaiah 14. Did you hear that? Look at verse 4 even. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. Okay? Again, this is relating to Babylon. How do you know it's Babylon? All you got to do is keep going down. Verse 22, even verse 21. Prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. For I will rise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remnant uh, and the son and the nephew and the Lord. Uh, sorry, uh, saith the Lord. And I will also... Make it a possession for the bitter in the pools of water, and I will sweep it with the besom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. Of course, destroying in what? The Assyrian, and I will break the Assyrian in my land, and upon the mountains tread him underfoot. When is this treading underfoot going to take place? This is the Lord. This isn't the enemy treading under treading the people underfoot. This is now the Lord who is going to tread the enemies under his foot. This is the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God. Okay? So we know there's a Babylon that goes to the end. Hence what we read in Revelation chapter 18. Right? Now, let me go show you what this said again. In Isaiah 19, uh, 14 19 but thou art cast out of thy grave he's thrown out but thou art cast out of thy grave wait a second we just saw in revelation chapter 17 he was is not and shall be when he comes out of the pit right out of his grave and then we read in Job chapter 41 that he is a double portion of something that he must repeat knowing that there's a was for him and it is to come. And then here we are in Isaiah knowing that Lucifer who is the one brilliantly covered beautiful cherub all of the precious uh, um, uh, uh, stones we're going to get to that all of the precious stones and all of this glory. We know that he's represented as Leviathan. He comes from the sea. He's going back to the sea and he's going to be what? Now here we are in Isaiah 14, 19 when he's kicked out of his grave. When he's kicked out of his grave. He was. He was then in the grave. And then what? Kicked out. Kicked out. He's coming out again. Like an abominable branch. Like what? Like an abominable branch? 
You mean kind of like an abomination, right? An abominable branch? Well, when do you think that portion is? Of course, it's Matthew's portion. Because when he comes out of the grave, we know it's when he's coming out of the pit. And when he comes out of the pit, we know it's Matthew's discourse. And it's the Matthew's discourse of the abomination of desolation in the holy place. Because what did he just say? He just said in Isaiah 14 that he's going to what? I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation on the north side. You see, he's now saying he's going to sit in the temple of God. And the temple that has been rebuilt, we know when he comes up out of the grave that he is the son of perdition. At the time of the falling away, which is the time of mid trumpets. And he's going to what? Claim to be God in the temple of God. You see, Satan's not the one. Years ago, I used to think that it was Satan because when Satan's cast down, Satan is the one who's going to go in and declare himself God, but he's not. He's giving that authority to Lucifer. We know this because it's a copy. He is mimicking everything the father and son are doing, but in the wretched way to try to deceive the whole world. So just like the father has given it to the son, Satan is coming. And in that short time that he has, he's trying to give it all to Lucifer to take control from Jesus having it. It's wild stuff to see, guys, to be able to track these things, to be able to follow these things in Scripture. <clears throat> and he's called the uh, abominable branch, right? It's craziness. Now, I want you to recognize something. Lucifer was adorned with all sorts of precious stones. He was made right in, in beauty and in, in all the things that were so wonderful in his brightness. He was arrayed in all of this beauty. Well, now I want you to listen to this part because this is a part that I had never, ever caught before. I'd never seen it. I'd never heard a study on it. I didn't know it existed. But remember how I kind of opened this in saying that everything is a mimic that that we know as the Antichrist, that, that beast, the, 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 the Leviathan. He, he's copying everything of the Lord. And every time we find something like we did in the that clip to show the the purple that they realized and they lost their purple when they were kicked out of the garden which means they went from like that group being allowed to be in the garden to now being the flesh in the time of the flesh beginning every time we find new revelation or things that other people have found but didn't really have the other side of the story or the rest of the story and we come across these things fits exactly exactly where it's supposed to fit and the period of time of the conversation being had about it are you ready for this one check this out when it comes to lucifer there's there's the understanding of his attitude that comes from isaiah 14 12 through 15 in the theology world they call this the five i wills Isaiah says, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, here's the five I wills, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And here's the biggie. I will be like the most high. And then Isaiah rounds it out and says, yet you will be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So you understand, first of all, that is what is commonly known in the church. A lot of people, they understand Lucifer and the five I wills and what happened. Okay, then we get into a description of what he looks like and what his kind of caricature of, of who he is. Ezekiel 28, 12 through 19. 
And it says, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So first of all, we're looking at somebody that is beautiful. The red skin with the horns and the dragon tail and the pitchfork, that's out the window. <laughs> thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Okay, well, 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 first of all, before we go any further, he's on earth, okay? Mm -hmm. Every precious stone was thy covering, and then the, the word goes on to, to mention what these stones are. Now, scholars have taken these different stones that are being listed in a very long list here and compared them to the priestly breastplate of the high priests in the Old Testament and the kings of the Old Testament and how they interacted and how they had different relationships with different stones. And if what we're looking at is, is literal, is that Lucifer, prior to his fall, is anointed in wearing the gemstones of the high priest. Hmm. So he's at least a priest so far. This is something that's very, very heavily overlooked. Say that again. The workmanships of thy tabrets and thy pipes were prepared in thee the day that thou wast created. So he was a masterful musician of some kind, right? Yeah. Literally built into his creation. Master of music. You wonder where some of that weird satanic music comes from and why it carries with it such a demonic presence and power yeah. that you see. You know, you hear Absolutely. those testimonies. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub. He's a cherub. Mm. So when you look at what's actually being described here, we have not only a cherub, which is, you know, we can get into this in a little bit if you'd like to, not only the highest creation order of all celestial beings in, in matters of authority and beauty and presence and mm -hmm. commandeering power, but he's possibly a king priest. And I'll tell you that those, those scholars uh -huh. who have literally looked at the covering stones and all of that, the words about him being anointed, a covering cherub, and the precious stones are literal, then Lucifer mm. had undergone the ceremonial uh, anointing that consecrates one to follow in the Lord and to lead others to do so in the same manner as the Old Testament kings and priests. Hello. <clears throat> She said it about three or four times in there. His covering was of the priestly, kingly garment covering. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? What do we know? What have we been teaching over the last year, two years? Especially, well, especially the last year, but it's been two or three years. What have we been showing? What do we know? Christ, when he comes at the end of seals, when he's coming as the ox, the bull, when he's coming as what? As Messiah ben Ephraim, or the firstborn of Joseph, the Messiah ben Joseph. We know that when the Lord is coming at the end of seals, or the end of the sixth year of seals, he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, and he's coming as what? Check it out. Let's go to <clears throat> Psalms 110. Psalms 110, we've taught on many times. We all know where it is, what time it is. It says, The Lord, Father, said unto my Lord, Jesus, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord, Father, shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek? Again, it's all these things that we've taught on. Okay? What do we know from Zechariah chapter 6, which is a chapters to years, as you guys all know, which is in the chapters to years, these books that have opened that give us insight to prophecy and all of their years within them. And we come to Zechariah chapter 6, like a prophetic picture of the end of the sixth year of seals. And what do we see? We see that, do, 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 verse 11, then take the silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua. We all know Joshua is a prophetic typology of Yeshua, of Jesus, okay? The son of Josedek, 
the high priest and speak unto him saying thus speaketh the lord of hosts saying behold the name whose man is the branch and he shall grow up out of his place and he shall build the temple of the lord okay joshua the high priest and king who is the who is jesus who is the high priest king melchizedek at the end of seals and into the first half of trumpets and we know the branch is zerubbabel zerubbabel is the one who builds the temple who completes the work that he began during seals when only the foundation was laid and we know this because it says the council of peace shall be between them both both so we have jesus yeshua messiah okay we have understood this we have broken it down we've shown it every over and over again we know that the end of the sixth year of seal of seals this line between six and seven he's coming at the end of the sixth and he's coming on heavenly mount zion we know that he's coming as high priest and king joshua yeshua who is of the line of joseph who is the ephraim high priest typology he is the messiah ben joseph as what high priest and king what happens at mid trumpets ten and a half years into tribulation or in the 11th year which is ten and a half or the 18th in the big picture in john's chapters in order we know that christ has been here right so christ shows up he is high priest and king Melchizedek and he's here for the seventh year of seals the 144 are sealed the the great multitude rapture happens there's silence in heaven for about the space half an hour I believe that's when he makes the peace agreement with all nations and then what does he do for the first three and a half years of trumpets he's here with the 144 wherever they go he's helping them and so forth and we know he's above uh, um, the modern day Zerubbabel, even though Zerubbabel, and it's between them both, the high priest and king is the one that has the direct connection to the father. Okay, so what do we know? The city, streets, wall, and temple is being rebuilt during the first three and a half years of trumpets. Until what? Until the pit is opened. Until the pit is opened. And when the pit is opened, who is coming out? Of the pit now going in to proclaim himself as God sitting in the throne of God proclaiming himself to be God now as the son of perdition Lucifer Satan was cast down the pit was opened all three of them are there and what do we have Lucifer goes in to proclaim himself God what was Lucifer as we just described, as she just described, what was he dressed as? As the picture of a high priest and king. He was the image of a high priest and king in his garments. And what was he? He was the brightest, shining uh, a cherub, right? He was the most beautiful, most radiant, high priestly king, cherub, shining bright. Hmm. Who else do we know? who is a bright, shining light, high priest, and king. Uh, the real one? Christ? So here we have Lucifer, when he comes out of the pit, who is so beautifully adorned and gorgeous, who will go into the temple of God, which has now been rebuilt, in the third temple in the first half of trumpets he will <clears throat> make war as we know against the messiah ben joseph against the two witnesses we know that that war is going to last the two and a half years that we were talking about when satan is here and who goes into that temple at that point to proclaim himself god brothers and sisters who's the only one we know that can go into the inner part of the temple the high priest 
There was Jesus going in as the high priest and king. He's there leading as high priest and king Melchizedek. And here, the pit is open. Lucifer comes back. He's this beautiful, radiant, bright, extremely handsome, high priestly covered garment. An exact copy of the enemy side of Christ to usurp the world who's then going to take over as this believed high priest and king and so much of the world is going to believe it. How do we know? We know because when the two witnesses are killed after the two and a half year war that takes place, remember, he's going to make war against them. And he's going to make war. We know that this war from, from, from Daniel is going to last two and a half years. Huh. And when this two and a half year war is done, the two witnesses are killed. And when the two witnesses are killed, <clears throat> what does the rest of the world do? And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them uh, that dwell on the earth. They're going to celebrate. You had two guys that were the righteous ones that were doing the things in truth and in righteousness and the world that was left didn't like it. They wanted to live in their own vanity, fallen ways. And so when Lucifer shows up, and all the things are going his way. And they kill the two witnesses. The world that's left rejoices. And is celebrating with Lucifer. The one who appears to be. Even to Jews that won't believe yet. That appears to be. The high priest and king. There won't be many Jews left at that point. But there's going to be there's going to be still Gentiles. There's still going to be Jews. But we know that there is going to be a group of Jews that will then be a frightened after the two witnesses stand up, go into heaven, you see, and they freak out and they give glory to the God of heaven. Not everybody's going to succumb to Lucifer stepping into the now completed temple, appearing to be the high priest and king because he's adorned just like one. He's even bright like Christ, not as bright, obviously. And he's going to look more beautiful, it would appear, too, at that point. People like somebody who looks very, very beautiful, right? It's a copy. It's a copy. I had never understood that before. I had never recognized that the covering that Lucifer was covered in was, was this... this anointed cherub covering that was like the high priests and kings. He's going to mimic. And what do you think the rest of the worth, the earth of those that are left in it at that point are going to believe? Well, if he just killed the two witnesses, they may think he's very well the guy. And the other one was the imposter. Right? Those that don't know, those that are be blinded, those that aren't meant to hear it. There's going to be a lot of them left. It's so awesome. And this is why even now we get to the end of Revelation. And what do we see in Revelation chapter 16? We see in verse 13, something that I've shared a lot. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, which is Satan. Out of the mouth of the beast, which is Leviathan Lucifer, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, which is the second beast, Bohemoth. You see, this is the evidence. I don't know how anybody else explains this when it comes to prophecy that there are three of them. When they try to say that the beast is the Antichrist who is who is Satan and Lucifer, yet there's the dragon. It's impossible. There are three of them. Now watch this. Look at how crazy this gets. Oh, we can go into 2nd Esdras 15. Watch this. In 2nd Esdras 
chapter 15, <clears throat> we've got some more on this. Look at this. So chapter 15, uh, starting in, cha in verse eight, uh, 28, Behold, a terrifying sight appearing from the east, the nations of the dragons of Arabia. Remember what I was talking about in the beginning? A group of people of Arabs. We have shown that it is absolutely the Antichrist, the beast, the Satan. All, all of this is encompassed in the power and authority through the enemy over the Muslims. It's the Muslims. Okay, that's we know that they have their Mahdi and their prophet. Their Mahdi and their prophet is the beast, the false pro uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet. And yet the world still goes around trying to tell you it's it's this leader or that leader or this leader or that leader. No, it's Arab. And they will probably have control over these other nations. Listen to what it says. The nations of the dragons of Arabia shall come out with many chariots and from the day that they set out, their hissing shall spread over the earth. What you, dragons and hissing. Does that sound familiar to some of you guys? Look at this. Let's go to Genesis 3. No, well, we can go to Genesis 3. There's the serpent. What does the serpent do? Hisses. Who's the serpent? Revelation chapter 12 told us he's also the dragon. So the serpent or dragon who what? Hisses. Here they are, the dragons of Arabia, and they're hissing over all the earth. And everybody's in fear and trembling. Then the dragons, remembering their origin and coming together, verse 35, they shall dash against one another and shall pour out a heavy tempest upon the earth and, and their own tempest. Listen to this. And there shall be blood from the sword as high as a horse's belly. Sound familiar again? Here we are in 2nd Esdras. The latter portion of 2nd Esdras, which we haven't gone into very much. But when I saw that with the dragon in Arabia, or the dragons in Arabia, I was like, oh man, there's even more here. Look at what we see. From Revelation 14. Uh, Revelation 14, starting in verse 19. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city. Remember what we said? That when the Lord returns, as it said, he's going to be the one to tread them. That we saw a treading of them in, uh, in what was it, in, in Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28. It says, and the winepress was trodden without the city, and the blood came out of the winepress, even to the horse's bridles, by the space of 1,600 furlongs. Sound similar? Blood from the sword as high as a horse's belly. It has to be a time of the dragons. And there shall fall, uh, and there shall be fear and great trembling upon the earth, and those who see that wrath shall be horror-stricken, and they shall be seized with trembling. Verse 40. And great and mighty clouds, full of wrath, and a tempest shall rise to destroy all the earth and its inhabitants, and shall pour out upon the very high and lofty places a terrible tempest, Verse 43, and they shall go steadily to Babylon and shall destroy her. Remember when we talked about Babylon at the end? We did a video a few months ago and Babylon being destroyed, that her plagues will come upon her in one day. Right? It's talking about the, the plagues in the, in the bowls, the vials, the bowls. They're going to be very quickly taking place and it's going to be over Babylon. So it says, and they shall go steadily to Babylon and shall destroy her 
and they shall come to her and surround her, and they shall pour out the tempest and all its wrath upon her. And the dust and smoke shall go up to heaven. Listen to this. And all who are about her shall wail over her. Sound familiar? And all who are about her shall wail over her. Let's go check it out. Revelation 18. This fall of Babylon. The delicacies, those in her plagues. Come out of her. That great city, Babylon. That mighty city for in one hour is thy judgment come. These are the plagues. And what do we know about it? Because uh, she was purple and scarlet, da, 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 dainty, goodly. And what do we find out about when she's destroyed? And the merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. Same thing. Wailing <clears throat> over seeing her destruction. It's pretty wild. It's all over the place. So now watch this. When does this period of time start with the dragon? Okay. So again, connected to the dragon, this is, this is all connections going back and forth in relation to the final portion of the trumpet judgments, the final two and a half to three and a half years and that final year being the treading of the grapes and the destruction and everything else. We see right here in verse 57. Your children shall die of hunger and you shall fall by the sword and your city shall be wiped out. Uh, and all your people who are in the open country shall fall, fall by the sword. And those who are in the mountains and highlands shall perish of hunger. Listen to this. And they shall eat their own flesh out of hunger and drink their own blood out of thirst. Remember all the waters dried up, right? All the rivers are dried up. They're all going to be eating each other. Remember how we talked about this even in Zechariah? In Zechariah chapter 11? In Zechariah chapter 11, which is the time when, when Messiah, when, the, when Messiah, Ben Joseph, right? Jesus is cut off. When the temple has been complete, when the pit is opened, and he says in verse 10, and I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all people. And in that day it was broken. What ends up happening? <clears throat> verse 16. And lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall not visit those that be cut off. Neither shall seek the, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still, but he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear the claws of, uh, in pieces. Uh, and tear their claws in pieces, okay? We know, here it is up here, da -da 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 -da, right up here. This is the more accurate one. In verse 9, Then said I, I will not feed you. That that die, let it die. And that that be cut off, let it be cut off. And let the rest eat every one the flesh of another <laughs> now you get the picture right i mean many of you guys that have followed for a bit you get the picture when matthew's discourse said that at this point of mid trumpets that the abomination of desolation which is taking place here in zechariah 11 is this abomination in the holy place when the false christ and has come back from the pit now and the false prophet's still there and it says that this is going to be worse than even Mark's mid-seals was, but that it will never be ever this bad again. That's what it's telling you. It's going to be so crazy bad, we couldn't even imagine. But when the Lord comes in that final year and destroys them all, man, I couldn't even imagine what all that is going to look like. So now watch this in relation to in relation as I bring this to a close watch what happens here we know the chapters to years that I was sharing on a little while ago okay we see this right here that when the pit is opened when we know that the 
Antichrist, the 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 beast, the Leviathan. See, I keep trying to reiterate so that make sure you guys get it. Who is Lucifer? We know that he's what. The high, he he's a he's a copy. He's he's the enemy high priest. What else do we know about him? When he comes the first time, we know he's coming about the middle of two and a half years. So in the third year, and we know that in the eleventh year, right here, in the eleventh year in the big picture, okay, in relation to John chapter eleven, but the fourth year of seals. We see in the fourth year of seals, watch what happens. Let's go to Revelation chapter 6 and just see what we know is happening. The fourth seal, which is what? The pale horse. So much of the earth is being killed. And when you open the fifth, when he opens the fifth seal, you see the souls of those who have already been killed. Which means what? There's all this killing. From the third to the fourth of the Christians. So watch what happens. When we go to, right here. When we go to chapter 11 of John, we should see if we see something. Because what, do we, what does this period of time relate to? It's the mid-seals. It's the time when the Christians are being killed. And it relates to Mark's portion, right? It relates to Mark's portion, which is the days of creation, when that portion of Lucifer and, and that creation of light, you see, Christ was created in light, and Lucifer was this great being of light. It's this clash of these two great lights, of which, of course, Christ is the greater. And Lucifer's trying to usurp it. And what is he first trying to do? He's going to try to usurp Jesus's people the lost sheep of the house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in in the midst of seals And what else do we know? We know that in Matthew's portion. So we've got one in Mark's portion. We've got one in Matthew's portion and in Matthew's portion We know at the midpoint of trumpets, which would be John chapter 18. Here's a new revelation here today guys and why because I finally understood that the the copy of Lucifer is so a copy. It is so crazy copied, like so mimicked. It's incredible. It is incredibly an exact opposite copy, one good and one wicked. And having now understood this high priest that Lucifer represents wait until you see what scripture tells us about the high priest one that would be in the midst of seals when the Christians are being killed connected to Mark's group and another time in mid trumpets when the pit is open and he comes back and it's Matthew's group okay Check this out. This blew my mind when I saw it. Okay. Oh, we can go to John, but I'm going to do this instead. Watch this. I went and did a search for high priest because, of course, I ended up, because we know that John is a prophetic picture of the seven easy years, like working for Rachel, then ends up getting Leah. Then you have the seven years that he has to put in for Rachel. And then you got the six for the, the cattle. And he completed 20 years. And there's the resurrection of the Lord. The covenant is made. And then there's your 21st year. Okay. So what do we know happens? We know that in chapter 11 is about Middish seals and the killing of the Christians. We know in chapter 18, this is why I first went to it. I discovered the rest early afterwards. But in chapter 18 is the point where we know that um, that the, the betrayal has happened of Christ in what happened in the is, but same with the is to come. You see, when Christ was betrayed and then taken into the hands of sinful men, we know the entire story was what? 
when he was betrayed and then taken into the hands of sinful men, crucified, put in the grave, and resurrected, the entire storyline was about two and a half days. When events that have taken place that have already happened in, in the vast majority of places within the Gospels that have already played out as days, like we show at the Transfiguration being years, like going to the story of Enoch and those days being as years. And when we go into the chapters, two years, we know that it was what? Two and a half days from beginning to end with Messiah. The end of days picture is two and a half years. Satan's time and his short time that he has is two and a half years. So it's not about Messiah being killed here but that he's cut off and a war breaks out against them for two and a half years, and then we know the again happens. So we have this days as years for one, and this is why I was going in to John chapter 18, because it's the story of what we know, just like chapter 11 of Zechariah. Okay? The cutoff happens. In Zechariah, listen to this. We're in the Gospel of Matthew, we're in Zechariah 11, and in John 18. In Matthew's Gospel, we've shared on this a number of times, in Matthew's Gospel only, the betrayal that Judah does is defined by 30 pieces of silver. In Mark's, it's not defined, it's just money. In Luke's, it's not defined. It's just money. Only Matthews is defined by 30 pieces of silver. And what am I talking about? Matthew's portion of trumpets. Now, what else am I talking about? Zechariah being it chapter 11. So we go to Zechariah, the same typology and time frame in the chapters to years. Satan's cast down. He has to break his covenant. Um, he breaks his covenant. And what is he offered? Way for my price, what? 30 pieces of silver. How much was it? 30 pieces of silver and cast them into the potter in the house of the Lord. The exact same timing of Matthew to the 30 pieces of silver to what does John 18 tell us? Let's go have a look at John 18. The same prophetic built-in time frame and we see when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook of Kajan, where was a garden. Ha ha. How about that? Why was there a garden? Because the Lord came on heavenly Mount Zion, which was paradise, where he received everybody for the great multitude rapture. And who comes to betray him? Ta-da. Judas comes to betray him. And when Judas betrays him, it says, uh, having received the band of men and officers from the chief priests. So I see the chief priests. And then I keep going. Again, this is the betrayal of Judas in the Matthew portion in relation to the 30 pieces of silver to Zechariah chapter 11, which is the equivalent to John 18. And guess how many times I see the word high priest. High priest, high priest, high priest, high priest. <laughs> you get the picture? High priest, high priest, high priest. Seven times the word high priest shows up in John 18. Now, prior to understanding what we now understood today about Lucifer, I didn't really know what the, this point of high priest being so prominently mentioned there was. But now that I understand that it's the mimic of Lucifer, check it out. Let's see where this word high priest is used, how often it's used, and the time frame it's used. Matthew 26, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Five times. It's used five times in Matthew 26 
about the high priest again Caiaphas okay so it's the high priest and what is the represented time frame of Matthew 26 you guessed it right here with the betrayal of with the betrayal of uh, of Judas okay well watch this where else do we find it once in mark 2 but in a different relation now watch this in mark 14 we find it once twice three four five six seven times in mark the high priest is talked about seven times in the mark portion seven times it's spoken about in the Matthew portion five times it's spoken about it gets good when you realize who this high priest is the one in Luke it's not really a big deal it's just the mention of the ear being cut off now listen to this the only place you find this high priest connected with Caiaphas in John which is our chapters to years is in chapter 11 twice check this out there he is mentioned twice in chapter 11 connected to Mark's portion when who's here when when who's here now going after the Christians the beast the Antichrist remember in Mark's portion in Mark's discourse remember there's there's no false prophet no false Christ until the time of the abomination and it's the time where they flee into the wilderness and then you have the false Christ and false prophet show up what's that timing right here it starts here in the only the six months only half of this year and then the killings and so forth going after the Christians really kicks off and it's mentioned this high priest is mentioned twice in John 11 which is mid seals which is Mark's group where it was mentioned seven times in Mark now what about John we got that covered for Mark's portion what about Matthew's portion chapter 18 1 2 3 4 5 6 is that six or seven times one two three four five six seven times we have this high priest Caiaphas being mentioned only in John 11 and John 18 there was one for Mark its connection is seals to the one that was spoken about in Mark seven times to then one in Matthew related to the 18th chapter and it being mentioned again this guy Caiaphas who is called the high priest do you know who this guy Caiaphas is remember when we get to Matthew's discourse as we shared earlier there was no false prophet in the first half remember uh, uh, sorry false Christ there was only false prophet and it just so happens that he doesn't get mentioned in John again until chapter 18 which would be at the time of the abomination of desolation do you see how these things continuously prove out we have got so many revelations so many prophetic pictures for purposed verses purposed chapters we have gone through these things and have pulled out hundreds of revelations that give us prophetic pictures and confirm each other over and over and over and over again and here's another one from chapter 11 Caiaphas the high priest to chapter 18 Caiaphas the high priest one for the mid seals one for the mid trumpets both being the same guy did you follow the theme double bridal killed come back in marks not in first half of Matthews then in Matthews again was is not and then shall be 
It's not hard to figure out anymore, is it? It's repeating itself over and over and over. And with this piece of revelation that he is a copycat high priest and king being in his brightness and everything else, watch what happens. Let's go to John 18. As I wrap this up, see, we got good time today. As I wrap this up, look at what it says about him. Who is it about? It's Caiaphas. Caiaphas is this high priest. Okay? Caiaphas, one of the meanings of his name is Del. Want to see another meaning for his name? It comes from the noun rock. What? When I saw this, I knew that this was the revelation to the connection. I discovered this yesterday with all of that other stuff. I knew that this was the connection. Actually, no, it's a couple days ago now that this was the connection to Caiaphas being the rock. Who do we know is the rock? Christ is the rock, of course. But what is Christ? You see the little rock? <clears throat> Not Peter, right? We have Peter who is, Peter is the, is a piece of rock, right? He is a little rock. Not, not this little type of rock here, like a piece of rock. This little rock is another copy of what? He's a high priest, little rock, and the places he shows up, who is the one persecuting Christ, is the one who is copying and trying to get rid of the big rock. And look at this. Let's go to Deuteronomy 32. I haven't shared on this in so long. Deuteronomy 32. I remember when I first came across this several years ago. And in the very early days. Okay. Even let's start this. In Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock capital R. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Who is just and right is he? The big rock, the uppercase rock. Okay. Now watch what happens. Let's go to this story. This is a great one. I haven't spoken on it. Like I said, in a long time. Where is it? Oh yeah, right here. We'll start in verse 29, Deuteronomy 32, 29. Oh, that they were wise, they that understood this, that they would consider their latter end, okay? The end times, that they would understand their posterity, what is coming for them in the what? End of days. You can try and tell me they thought it was the end of days back in Deuteronomy. It's like when we go to... um. Oh, where is it? Genesis chapter 49. You go to Genesis chapter 49. It's the same thing, right? 49 verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Okay? When we see the description of all of their meanings and everything else, it becomes pretty clear. It's prophecy. Oh, sure, there was something for them then. But it says in the last days. It's in the end. In the end time, the future, the posterity at the end. Same thing. So in Deuteronomy 32, we're seeing the same conversation that they would consider their latter end. Now listen to this. How should... One, chase a thousand. Okay? Think of like Satan's time when he comes up. And two, think of false prophet and antichrist. Uh, um, yeah, false prophet and antichrist. Beast one and beast two. How should two put 10,000 to flight except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up? Now listen to this. For their rock is not our rock. What was that? 
for their lowercase r rock is not our uppercase Christ Lord Jesus rock. Who do you think this rock is who's trying to copy this rock? How about the one whose name means rock who is a high priest trying to mimic or remove Christ who is the high priest the prophetic picture in the end of days is absolutely perfect he's right here being shown to us for mark's portion he's right here being shown to us for matthew's portion and in this portion right here we see him as the little r rock who is trying to remove our lord uppercase r rock as the high priest and king who is the false high priest and king that Lucifer is, this is who Caiaphas is portraying to be the little R rock. Pretty crazy, right? Pretty darn crazy. And this is the definitions of the high priest in the KJV in their biblical meaning, in their timing, connected to Caiaphas, in relation to realizing that Lucifer is so much more a false copy of Christ than I had ever realized even before. For as much as we had understood, for as much as we understood the differences between the two, and between the difference with Satan, not only can we show their difference is clear, not only can we show that there are three, that we can show that the Leviathan is out of the seat and out of the abyss, which is precisely where the first beast out of the sea, who is Lucifer, is coming from. Who is going to proclaim himself to be, as Lucifer said he would, is going to happen in the end of days when he comes out of the pit. Who's going to have two portions of time in a repeat, whereas Bohemoth will be there straight through. And then finally, when it's over, at the treading of the grapes and at the wrath of God in the 14th year, the Lord will cast those two not into the pit this time, but into the lake of fire alive. And Satan will then be cast into the pit for his portion of time for a thousand years. What? And to find out that he was such a covering cherub in his brightness in all that is like a mimic copy of Christ. He is pictured as an anointed high priest and king cherub to mimic Christ, when he will especially take over or attempt to take over and sit in the throne to declare himself God. It is not kind of possible. It is undeniable fact revealed here from Scripture that it is Lucifer, not Satan, who is going to sit in that throne to proclaim himself God, appearing like the bright shining light who is beautiful and gorgeous and who is dressed like a high priest and king. And the scriptures reveal it to us in the name of Caiaphas, who is a little rock against our rock, the little high priest trying to be the real high priest, to try to dethrone the high priest the true high priest to mock and become the claimed high priest and it's right there in the gospel of john being revealed to us again not only proving out our chapters to years again but far beyond that in showing to us that within the descriptions of the story, 
Caiaphas, the little rock, is the high priest trying to remove Christ. You see, when I say, when the church tells us that that prophecy in Scripture is, is one-third of the book, well, that's pretty good. But when you really understand what is going on here in the books that are being opened, it's at least 50, if not 75, maybe the entire book. And we can understand why prophecy is so vitally important, guys. Because prophecy not only helps us to understand and be ready in Christ, spirit-filled for the is to come, but it helps us understand Christ in a level, in a way that otherwise wouldn't be understood without prophetic understanding. It's not only for what was. It's for what is or it's not only for what is to come, it's for what is and what was. We can understand it more clearly than ever before. And this is why we read in Revelation 19.10, halfway through, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God for the testimony, the testimony, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I'm not saying it. I'm reading it from the word. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And what better way to show that than in all of these teachings, being able to go in and see things that have been there for centuries Suddenly, through the revelation, because now is time over these last seven years, that the Lord has said, now it's time. Now is time to prepare a people to reveal the prophetic understandings of the was, is, and is to come laid out throughout all of his books. Could you imagine? I mean, we did it. We did a three-part series, if you remember where we broke down the, the, the book of Romans and the prophetic picture in Romans. We've broken down the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We've gone through all sorts of scripture that none of us had ever realized were prophecy. There were parts that we knew were prophecy, like the discourses, for example, maybe little hints here and there. But story after story, differences within each gospel being revealed as prophetic understanding for the end. Things that are in it that, that relate to what's actually going to be a future that couldn't have actually happened yet. All revealing prophecy. We went again, as we often do, from Genesis to Revelation and a half dozen or more, maybe dozen, other books within Scripture between Genesis and Revelation. We've even included three Apocryphas to this one and used some teachings from others to build on to see a revelation that was waiting for us to be revealed in the Scriptures. It was awesome. This is why people wonder why I get so excited, you know. I'm not I'm not trying to be excited. I'm not trying to to do anything. I am just as I say all the time. I am literally as in awe of all of this as I was from September 8th when I realized my life had changed and something was happening. September 8th, 2017. It's been a wild ride of revelation ever since it's awesome and i know it isn't over yet i know it won't end until everything's over we know because of luke chapter 24 that even those being prepared in it when the son of man returns for his 40 days and those being prepared in it are chosen to remain in it for him to serve him that's when he will open the rest to them crazy stuff guys Beautiful, 
awesome stuff. Come join us tomorrow, 6.30 Mountain Standard Time, Black Swan Revelations. There's going to be some great stuff in there. I'm going to really hit on a point when it comes to the discourses too that you're going to see clearly for yourselves that the end of tribulation is unequivocally Feast of Trumpets. Not only the end of the 13th year, but the end of the 14th to the additional days that we know of, which you know is also why Marx has it and why Luke's doesn't. We know that the 14 years begin and end on the Feast of Trumpets. There's 50 days before and there's 10 after, and it can all be proven. Absolutely, I have no doubts whatsoever that it's from Scripture. Not the 50 days above, not the 10 days after, but the beginning of the 14 to the end of the 14 is 100% going to begin at the Feast of Trumpets and end at the Feast of Trumpets. And I'm going to lay that out tomorrow and prove it unequivocally that you will understand if we know there's 50 days before, then guess what? Feast of Trumpets, less 50 days, is exactly where we've revealed it. Now, what we hope and pray for is that we've understood that truly 2024 is the year. And everything, scripture, sun, moon, and stars, <clears throat> and revelation is revealed in the seven-year Shemitah cycles, we are here. So I pray with all of my heart that we have understood and even more, I pray that if this is the time that we are all ready and that we can bring as many people as possible with us. So with that, come join us tomorrow. And if you can, please remember, come and share uh, if you can with support and with prayers so that we can reach more people through our brother Steve in Uganda and others around the world through the ministry. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. Soak this one in. Go and seek it out for yourself. Track it, follow it, and understand it. And I'm sure in the coming weeks, we will continue to build on it and what deeper things will be revealed from it. I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.